And we we have several good questions here, and there's a, a few minutes that we have to, to ask them. After we finish with the Q&A, feel free to, to linger around. Um, as most of the students are aware, there's pizza that will be served afterwards, and there are boxes for your comment cards and extra credit tickets. Um, but we do have some really good questions that I'd really like to hear your response on. So first, what are your thoughts on the fair trade movement? Is it a more successful approach to helping the developed world, <coughs> or is it also problematic? Okay, that's a good question. By the way, if you want, later, I'll just do it quick, quick. I actually have maps that show the connection between property rights and prosperity. So red is no property, very low property rights. Green is high. So you can see wealthy countries tend correlated, right? Same thing with um, freedom from corruption, which is rule of law. And same thing with freedom of doing business, okay? And this goes to my point that um, poor people aren't somehow different from us. They're excluded. So I can get if you, I can tell you where to get some of that information. These are, these are a little bit older, newer ones, but okay. So um, where is what do I think about fair trade? Now, for, fair trade is very is very complex um, because it, it's not it's not a simple problem. It's not a simple problem. There's I think a real some real benefits of fair trade. Some of the benefits of fair trade are, and I'm going to go fast because I know there's more than one question. Number one, um, sometimes it can help people, and I'm not an expert in fair trade, but I know enough to at least talk about it. Number one. It can help, sometimes it, it creates um, good co working conditions. So sometimes you'll have slaves actually working on different kind of, you know, cocoa or coffee or whatever it might be. Fair trade says we want to make sure that there's, there's no slave labor and good working conditions. That can be a very positive element of fair trade. Um, fair trade can also um, uh, create opportunities for, for certain farmers to kind of participate in co-ops, right? So there are some positives that come from fair trade. Um, uh, okay, there are also some potential negatives. One, fair trade can, it can actually cost a lot of money for a farmer to get a fair trade certification. So they're paying like three, four, five thousand dollars to get the certification, which means they need to make, you know, a lot more money to make their, to get their money in. Two, you have um, sometimes lower quality things. So with coffee, for example, um, uh, if, as fair trade becomes the, the, the um, model, um, <coughs> as fair trade becomes the model, um, you, you're actually getting lower quality coffee, which then harms the price of coffee later on, and there's all these kind of negative incentives. The other thing that can happen sometimes um, is that a fair trade becomes a fad, so it's a fad in the United States. It's actually falling away, but it was a very big fad for a long time. Um, and so everybody wants fair trade. Well, if you have fair trade, then people are moving into, they're responding to economic incentives. It's slower in the developing world, but there are more people are moving into coffee than perhaps should be moving into coffee, right? And so when the fair trade fad goes, right, you actually have oversupply and lower price. So they should have been going somewhere else. And the third thing I'll point out is this. A lot of the countries that grow coffee or, or cocoa could actually grow sugar. But you know, in the United States, we subsidize our sugar. And we've put tariffs to prevent sugar inputs. So here's the real question. Is fair trade a distraction from larger questions of inclusion? Right? Okay, well, what if we just didn't subsidize our sugar and let people grow sugar and sell it? Would that, might be, be, would that be better? Right? And I know this is a sugar-producing state, so yeah, it's a, right? this hits right home, I guess. Um, right? But it's not just here. This, 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 so these are, these are kind of broad questions. Same thing with rice, same thing with other questions. So um, a lot of times it, it can become a distraction. If you want to read, but, but it is, it's not all bad and it's not all good, and there's no panacea. It's like microfinance. Microfinance can do really good things, at the, helping people get from abject poverty to poverty. It can really give people first access to capital. If it's done like a merchant bank, if it's done like a credit card, it destroys you, right? Because you're putting 48% on consumer debt, all right? So um, if there's, there's a book that we have at the Acton Institute um, by an economist named Victor Klar, who's at Florida Gulf Coast University, and you can read about that. I'll give uh, Professor Jackson the link to that. Next question. This is another good one. Um, so are the causes of poverty in developing countries comparable to causes of poverty in the U.S.? So I guess the, the other half of that is then, do our, our attempts at eliminating poverty at home subject to some of the same issues, or how is it different? Yeah. So one thing I want to say, I hope I, did, I hope I said this at least 50 times in the, in the talk, but I don't think I did, and that is poverty is really, really complex. There's no single solution to poverty. Good people can disagree. Um, and it, it takes real kind of humility and wrestling 
to, to kind of go back and forth through these things. So that's, that's the first. So that's why fair trade's complex, microfinance is complex, poverty in the United States and poverty in the developing world is complex. Generally speaking, okay, there, I would say, I would say generally speaking, the problems of poverty in the developing world are a bit different than the problems of poverty in, say, the United States or Europe, all right? The reason for that is, is that generally speaking, okay, this is generally, I have to do this answer quickly, the main reason people are poor in the developing world is they don't have access to private property, rule of law, free association, and ability to participate in the formal economy. That's not the main reason people are poor in the United States. Okay, so you do have, um, some, you have poverty, say the United States, you have poverty, and it comes from a number of, of causes. Some poverty just comes from, say, mental illness, right, uh, drug addiction, right, other kind of bad choices, uh, and a lot of other things that take place. Generally speaking, you don't have the same institutional exclusion in the, developing, in the developed world, say in the United States, that you do in developing countries. That's not to say there's not institutional exclusion in the United States. I think, for example, if we look at, um, at the war on poverty, and if we look at the African American community, we see a couple of things. All right, and this happens broadly, but I, I'm going to use this as an example because I think it's very interesting. Number one, if you look at the African American community, um, you have, first of all, incredibly high levels of abortion rates among African American communities related to their population. So we're aborting their children. If you look at places like Planned Parenthood, they're focused in like um, African American communities. Two, we send them to failing schools that are dominated by powerful interest groups. And so they're stuck in terrible schools. And three, we imprison their men at a high rate. So if, you, if your children are being aborted, sent to failing schools, and men are imprisoned, you're creating the conditions for long-term poverty and for family breakdown S to the point where we have about, I think, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, about 70 plus percent of African-American babies not born into biologically intact married families, okay? And I'll tell you why that's important in just a second, all right? So is there institutional, I think, uh, exclusion? I think the answer is absolutely the yes, okay? But it's not the same thing that's going on in the developing world broadly where you, because you can get access to private property, rule of law, and free association. You can, right? Um, but you might have other things that are causing it. Here's the biggest problem that's causing poverty in the United States. It's really determined by a lot of things, but one of the biggest determinants of it, right? And again, there's multi-level, multi many, many factors, right, across the board. But one of the biggest determinants of poverty in the United States is family, um, uh, family uh, um, consistency and tactness, you should call it, okay? If you're born into a white, intact family with biological parents, the chance of your being in poverty is 8%. If you're born into a white, non-intact family, okay, this is multiple, your chance of being in poverty goes up into the 30s. Okay? It goes up higher for, for Hispanics. And for African Americans, if you're born into a, a, a non-intact, broken family, your chance of being in poverty is at 49%. That's, almost, that's one in two. If you are an African American born into an intact family, biological parents, your chance of being in poverty is 8%, which is the same as it is for whites. Family plays huge impact in poverty rates because it creates a host of things, not simply love and care, et cetera, et cetera, right, that you would imagine but also creates all these levels of educational attainment, social capital, you have parents reading to you, you're able to gain all these levels of social capital and connections. And so this creates ability for people to have stability so that they can, they, they're out of poverty. So one of the biggest problems that we have in the United States um, is social policy that, cre that encourages family breakdown, and there's, that's very complex. So that's, I think, a much bigger cause of poverty in the United States than, say, for example, lack of private property rights, where generally speaking, most people can get access to private property rights and register their businesses within a couple of days. Next question. So I think that this, will, this will probably be the last question. If you have, like I said, if you have some lingering things that you want to ask, feel free to stick around for pizza afterwards. Um, so this will be the last formal question, then we'll, we'll go ahead and adjourn. Um, so how, how does China succeed 
as it has, it, it's without most of the institutions yeah. of justice as you've, descri as you've described. You know, so I'm not an expert in China, so I can't give like a, a detail, so we might even be able to get an extra question in because I won't have a very lot to say. Um, but I think <coughs> one is China has done, and China has done like certain what you call kind of capitalist shifts. So it doesn't, it, it actually um, can really um, violate the pr property rights of rural um, holders. There's a lot of serious problems in China, but what you basically have is, you know, certain areas or spaces that have adopted kind of market-based um, capitalist type of industry that's still somewhat controlled by, by the state, but not controlled by the state in the planning sense. You're actually allowing entrepreneurs to make decisions, right? So it still doesn't have political liberty and freedom, but it's created these kind of spaces. Um, and, and by doing that, it's, you know, it, it's been able to really generate a lot of people out of poverty. And so it's, it's a, one of the forces of getting people out of poverty. Um, so you, you kind of have a hybrid there. It's very complex to, to get into. I think there are, you know, th some people I think are a, a sanguine and think, oh, if they, uh, China continues to develop its, its economic liberty, political liberty will follow. Some people are less sanguine that think, you know what, the Chinese are using economic liberty merely as a means to generate income so they can keep power. I've actually talked to Chinese who talk about that. And so here's the last thing I'll say. I remember this, it struck me once. Zapatero was the prime minister of, of Spain, and he was a socialist prime minister. And the corporate taxes in Spain were lower than the corporate taxes in the United States. I'm like, what? And it kind of, and it struck me, and this is actually, a, this is a big, big, I'm opening a huge can of worms. But, um, but that's because socialism is not simply economics. Socialism is an anthropological cultural worldview that has a host of elements to it, of which economics is one. Generally speaking, socialist economics, not generally, not forget generally speaking, social economics fails. It always fails. It never produces wealth, right? So socialist governments and communist governments after a while begin to realize this. If you want to keep power, you, you allow for generally a type of capitalism that allows to create wealth so you can fund um, all the social services and all the increasing wealth so you can consolidate power. So you can in fact have, um, you can in fact have non-socialist economics with um, socialist social policy. Um, how long it lasts is, is, is a, I think a big question, but I think that's what you're seeing in China.